Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Butter What Show. I'm Pat Regan. This is my co-host, BrianCMoses.com from the, the Internet. And we're going to talk to you about Internet networking things today. With uh, Brian and I have been using TailScale for, I don't know about you, I've been relying on TailScale for about a year, but I've been using it for maybe a year and a half total so far. How about you? Yeah, probably right around the same amount of time. Um, you and a, a friend of ours, Chris, both told me you need to be looking into TailScale as VPN stuff, and I kept telling you guys, nope, I've tried, I've tried to go down that path before, and it's too much work. I don't want to do it. VPNs are hard. It's complicated, yep. and yep. I, I was resistant, and I was a, uh, I, I was foolish. You guys told me how easy it was. Yep. It's so stupid easy to use. And we should tell everybody what it, what TailScale is is and what it's used for. You hear VPN and you you know, this is YouTube, so everybody's gonna think of something like NordVPN, where the everybody has an ad for NordVPN, right? And that's something you connect to NordVPN and you route all your internet traffic through it so that people in the coffee shop that you're connected to can't see your public browsing data. And that is absolutely not, not. what you would generally use TailScale for. You can twist it into that role, but that's not what you're going to use it for. What TailScale does is it makes a direct VPN connection from each of your own machines to every other machine every that other you machine. own, that you install the TailScale client on. And basically what that does for you is it's like having all of your machines on the same local area network, the same LAN. Whether they're in the room, in the same house, you can have a machine in Japan, you could have a machine at Brian's house, you have a machine at my house, and they'll all act like they're directly connected to each other. Just work. And it just works. It's like magic. It has all the magic for punching through firewalls and finding ways around. Now, like there's a there's a particularly nasty situation you can get into where both of your hosts are on the same carrier grade NAT. So they can't get back out and back in. They have to find a way to connect to each other. And TailScale generally does a good job of making that connection. So you're not going all the way out to the internet and back again. You get to stay within your carrier's network. Which, but Tubby, what what are you using something like this for? What is what problem does this solve for you? Well, I mean, for a long time. I mean, ever since I built ever since I built my first NAS, people asked me if I had it exposed to the internet somehow for accessing my data remotely. And for a long time, the answer to that was just no. I mean, I'd, if I had something, I would use Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever, and I would sync the data between my NAS and my, my computers using Google Drive. Um, but now with TailScale using its relay node, I, I have access to my NAS, the Samba shares, the web interface, any of the any of the services that run on it, you know, wherever I am on either on any on any computer or phone, um, and I decided to start running Nextcloud as well. I've got a a virtual machine running on my NAS that's using some of the storage to actually replace Dropbox and Google Drive and and whatnot. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm real excited about that. I've I just started to really now, use it. Did you know I've officially saved money using TailScale now? How'd you do that? Well, I have a, uh, I use a, a program called C File. I have a C File server installed on a Raspberry Pi, and that Raspberry Pi has a 14 terabyte drive hanging off it. And that Pi, yep, Brian's pointing to it. It lives at his house now. And what C File is, you could, it's open source client side encrypted Dropbox is the way you can think of it. It keeps the files between my laptop, my desktop, and a couple other random machines, certain things here and there, synced up. And all of that, you know, as soon as I save a file, it gets uploaded to to Brian's house. And I have about, I think I'm at five and a half terabytes of synced data because these podcast type videos take up so much room. And... Yeah, I did the math when I the C, the P Raspberry Pi and the hard drive cost me about two hundred and seventy five dollars, and the first year that I was gonna, if I you know if I was gonna use Google Drive, if I was gonna get four terabytes from Google Drive, that would have cost me about two hundred dollars, and at some point in the middle of the year, I crossed over the point from 
you know, four terabytes to, you know, four point something terabytes, which would have increased my Google Drive bill from two hundred to three hundred dollars. So I was already twenty five dollars ahead. And this month I would be paying for my second year. So now I'm going to be five hundred or six hundred dollars. Nice. Well, not ahead. I'm going to be another three hundred dollars ahead pretty soon. Here, you did a good job. I think so. I think so I too. Think so. What else are you using Tailscale for? Well, both of us have it installed on our Pi KVM boxes. We do, yeah, we have. And what the Pi KVM is, just the real quick, you know, 30 second message. It's a software you install on your Raspberry Pi, and there's a hardware that plugs into the top, and it lets you plug it into a computer as the computer's keyboard, uh, monitor, and mouse, and you access the Pi remotely over the network which lets you act like you're virtually on the physical keyboard and mouse of that server. So I can hand this Raspberry Pi to Brian's parents. They could plug it into their laptop at home and we could remotely troubleshoot something because it'll automatically connect back to our network. That's fantastic. If, Isn't that amazing? Yep. I could have hosted a C file server without tail scale, but I get to do it for free because Brian is lovely enough to hang it off of his gigabit uh, Fios network at his house. Because of Tailscale, I don't have to worry about anybody breaking into it remotely over the internet. I have everything turned off on the firewall except for Tailscale. That It's basically invisible on Brian's network. I tried, to, have to, I tried to find it. He, he can't. He even knows where it is and he can't find it. But it's cool. It's like it's on my own LAN. And it's on my LAN even when I take my laptop over to the park. It's still right there what about your 3d printer my 3d print yeah you're right i didn't even put that on our list hubby yeah my octoprint server is on tail scale so you know if i go down the street i could keep an eye on a 3d print with the you know the webcam if i want to but that's not that's not a terribly practical thing but my octoprint and my cnc js for my shape Oco are both on tail scale you could go do some and speed runs on your unicycle and and monitor a 3D print between it's true between dashes. But you're, you're using it for home home assistant, aren't you? For your home automation? No, I what I am, but I don't use it much um, because of my SSL certificates. I need to keep it open. I need to keep my home assistant open to the internet for Google. But it, I'm going to pause here because this is going down a rabbit hole. The next version of Home Assistant closes that. You can access your your Google Home devices on your own network, I think. Oh, good. I saw a video like today about it. I'm excited about that. So maybe in the near future, I'll cut the cord and I'll use Home Assistant and Tailscale. Yep, and I, I never liked the idea of punching a hole in my firewall to forward a port to Home Assistant. I don't really want that yep. exposed. And I, all of our phones report telemetry back to, to Home Assistant. You know, like I use things, like I keep track of battery charge and stuff in the dashboard and i think that's pretty neat it's yeah. nice that that just always works it always talks to the same ip whether it's in the house or yeah like one of the cool things i'm gonna go off on a tangent i think i did it maybe. too it's all right one of the cool things about tail scale is like if you had if you had roommates you know you're all shit you there's three groups of laptops in your house right laptops and computers and things you could put your stuff on your tail scale network they could put their stuff on their tail scale network and you could block all your yeah, you, know, you could share workspace yep. with other people. And yeah, I'm... all of your stuff is always on your network. It's awesome. Yeah. Frank, the Pi KVM is it's, it's a... so handy. It's so cool. I only use mine about once a year, but when I want to use it, I'm so glad I have it. It just lives in my I have this uh case, the zipper case that used to have headphones in it full of you know, there's a Pi, there's an HDMI adapter, there's all kinds of cables and SD cards and all kinds of nonsense in there for, you know, for just in case. Mine's plugged into my NAS right now. I don't know why. I haven't used, I mean, I haven't, I haven't used it. I always have an HDMI cable connected to my server and it's long enough to reach the TV over here. So I don't really have to use the Pi KVM if I ever need, you know, absolutely need video, but yeah. It's still nice to have anyway. There's a number of times where, like, I don't know what I've done. Left a cable unplugged, and I can't reach my NAS, and I want to get to the console. You know, I have to choose between hauling out 
a monitor, a mouse, a keyboard, hooking it all up and looking, or just hook up the Pi KVM and sit back yeah, down and, and it's done. And it's done. Assuming that the thing, the switch isn't the problem. 